Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Suzanne Sanger. I'm the Executive Director of the Sunshine Coast Conservation Association. On behalf of Rhizome Up Media and the Greenfield Series and the SCCA, I want to welcome you to our fifth annual World Oceans Day event. Uh, this event is sponsored by the District of Seashelt and the Sunshine Coast Credit Union as well. So we're hosting this talk today in the territories of the Coast Salish peoples. We carry out our work to protect biodiversity in the territories of the Squamish, the Shishal, Pliamen, Klohus, and Hamalco First Nations. And I'm uh, zooming in today from Chekwelk at Katsum, Gibson's House Out. Uh, we're very grateful to live, learn, work, and play alongside our First Nations communities. We honor their deep connection with, understanding, and appreciation of nature, and recognize that traditional Indigenous knowledge doesn't live in the past. It is deeply rooted in the ancestral and eternal connection of First Peoples uh, with their lands and waters. It is in this spirit of connection that we bring our World Oceans Day Festival to the community. Through the sharing of remarkable feature and short films, talks, and in-person events, we hope to inform and inspire and cultivate connection between people and place to raise awareness of the role of our oceans in our everyday lives and their connection with all living things. Our Nemo Talk series aims to link up people and projects to support restoration and conservation of marine resources and habitats on the Sunshine Coast and beyond. Uh, we thank you all so much for joining the festival and engaging with us in a good way. Uh, I'm now going to introduce our very first Nemo Talk speaker for the series this year, Mike Price of the Sunshine Coast Rotary Club. Mike was a city engineer and city manager for the uh, city of Scarborough, Ontario for eight years. With the creation of the Mega City of Toronto in 1998, Mike was appointed to the position of General Manager of Toronto Water the fifth largest water and wastewater utility in North America, where he remained for seven years until taking early retirement in 2005. With this background in water and sewer programs, Mike brings extensive knowledge to the issues of municipal infrastructure on the Sunshine Coast. He has a keen interest in the environment and is a member of two Rotary International Action Groups and is currently the past president of the Rotary Club of Seashells. Over to you, Mike, to let us know about your presentation. Okay, thank you, Suzanne. You're and I do have a PowerPoint, so I need to share my screen. And we will. So hopefully, you can all see that. We are good. Okay. Um, yeah, as mentioned in the introduction, I am a member of the Rotary Club of Seashell and currently past president. And in case anyone doesn't know, Rotary is a volunteer service club. So our little club likes doing lots of physical projects in the community. And we really jumped on this particular project a couple of years ago, and uh, we're moving it along. And you'll notice throughout the talk, I will be talking about herring curtains. And we try to avoid the word nets, even though they look like them, because we're not catching herring. We're supporting the herring row. So, um, sort of a background as to why we got into it. Uh, looking at the big picture, of course, you got to recognize that um, we really want to try and save everything uh, from the uh, herring to the salmon and the whales because they're all connected. And uh, for generations, we know that the First Nations here on the coast and other places have been using the uh, the herring and the roe uh, as an important traditional food. And when you talk to some of the people, they tell you that there used to be huge um, amounts of herring up and down the coast in the Georgia Strait. But now the sightings are getting fewer and fewer. And so 
one of the reasons we got in it is to see what we can do to improve that. Um, if you start looking at the curtains, originally the idea came from the Squamish screen keepers. And they noticed that when the herring were spawning on the pilings on docks, that the eggs uh, quickly dried and died. And one of the reasons that they were laying their eggs on the piling is because the herring couldn't find their natural vegetation on which to lay their eggs. I mean, normally it's the kelp and the egrass. And they have been uh, dying because of the warming oceans, um, climate change. So what we're finding now is that um, you're getting a lot more starfish moving up. Starfish in the bottom feeders are killing off the eel grass shoots and the kelp. And therefore, the herring are finding it more and more difficult uh, to find locations where the eggs will survive. So what the stream keepers decided to do is if they experimented and hung a fabric curtain around the pilings, then the eggs survived. Then they hung the curtains as an alternative to uh, going onto the pilings. And now these fabric curtains are going up and down around docks and floats where the herring are observed to attract them away from the creosote. And the reason that we look for docks and floats is a easy access to get down there and put the curtains in and also to check them on a regular basis to knock off anything such as starfish and crabs. So after the stream keepers came up with this idea, the Rotary Club of Penda Harbor raised the idea of setting up uh, their own group to put in the curtains in and around Panda Harbor. And that's where the Lagoon Society and Leanne Ennis got involved and got the high schools uh, working on the project. And going back into 2015, 2017, there was pretty good success. And at that time I lived in Panda Harbor and uh, I was the president of that particular Rotary Club when we got heavily involved with Leanne in hanging curtains around. But after 2017, uh, we noticed that we saw fewer and fewer herring coming into the harbor. Then uh, there was a gentleman by the name of Sam Bowman in 2018. He started getting volunteers up and down the coast, mostly from Half Moon to Gibson's getting involved. And he, in 2019, managed to get 90 curtains hung on the Lower Sunshine Coast. I refer to the Lower Sunshine, which uh, is from Egmont down to um, the bottom end at the ferry terminal. Unfortunately, Sam relocated in 2020. And as I was then in the Rotary Club of Sea Shop, I suggested that we take on coordination of the project, which the club agreed to do. Uh, in 2021, we managed to work with the Rotary Club of Bowen Island, and they've got a couple of wildlife groups on the island, and they do the work. And then at the beginning of this year, we managed to convince the Rotary Club of Powell River to join by uh, hanging in curtains that Leanne supplied them. And one of the things that Leanne did for the various groups is she got the youth in the high schools involved. And she started with the high school in Panda Harbor. And this is a picture where she was in uh, Charlotte High School. And you can see Margie facing us. And uh, you can also see Tanya Hall, who's currently the president of the other Rotary Club in Seashell. So we get... Um, through Leanne, all four high schools on the Sunshine Coast have been involved in making the curtains as part of school projects. And before COVID, um, we had uh, the four 
clubs on the lower Sunshine Coast. Um, we had curtains made at the schools and the new curtains are being made. And here you see uh, Margie demonstrating for the Gibsons uh, volunteers how to make the curtains, simple ones. And we've still got Leanne Ennis supporting us as an independent consultant. And at the moment, we've still got my club is doing the coordination and Mark is doing all the field work. So just to give you a picture of this was the one on the left is the Penda Harbor High School making their curtains. And then you've got lowering the curtains in the water. That is um, Margie's partner, Ken, dropping them in down in Gibson's. And then you've got um, Penda Harbor guys checking one of the curtains. You just see some of the, uh, the eggs are starting to appear on that particular fabric curtain. And years ago, uh, the First Nations used tree boughs to harvest heron eggs. And it was very interesting in 2021, um, Margie introduced the Seashell youth to the traditional way of using boughs. And they did it at the uh, Seashell Indian Band dock at McLean Bay on the Seashell Inlet. And the pictures on the right, unfortunately, were not taken uh, there. Uh, I picked those off the internet, but that shows you the amount of the row that would be hanging onto some of the boughs. And the picture in the top shows how they uh, used to transport these rows into quieter bays so that the herring would actually, um, for want of a better word, hatch out and take off from a different location or a different bay. And Leanne Ennis, if any of you haven't met her, um, she used to be with the Penda Ocean Discovery um, Station, pods up in Penda Harbor. Uh, since COVID, she's no longer with them and she works for herself. And she's been experimenting with how to grow kelp from seed. She's doing really well, having great success. And now she's looking to expand her program. And what we'd like to see in the future um, down the road is maybe the herring curtains can be replaced with the kelp that um, Leanne has been growing and hopefully transplanting. Now, one of the new things for uh, this year is the DFO. I've been trying to track all of the herring and we've been kind of keeping track on what the DFO is doing because we're still concerned about the high quotas that they're allowing for catching of the herring. And in order to try and get an idea of where the herring come from and going to, um, they started a pilot project and she's calling it. And uh, this is Dr. Cleary from uh, DFO. It's a pilot project to collect genetic material she calls peripheral spawns, those that are separated geographically from the main spawning. And she was really keen to get samples from the success that we did have on some curtains in Porpoise Bay. So we had five curtains with eggs and using the uh, DFO in the uh, Sea Child Indian Band under Sid Quinn, um, they took some samples of the eggs from the successful curtains in uh, Popus Bay. And hopefully uh, they can keep track on those and tell us next year where they disappeared to and if they came back. So as uh, you probably imagine, you can't just sort of drop these curtains anywhere and unlike the movie the field of dreams you know build it and they will come 
you will only get the herring if they are noticed in the area, either the herring balls or people have spotted them off the dock. So you really need to know where the herring are before you even attempt to drop curtains in. And ideally, the curtains should be under 10 feet. You will notice in this older picture in Panda Harbor, the uh, two guys are watching a female uh, do the hosing down. And that was a 40 foot long curtain. They were big and bulky and uh, took a lot of handling. And so now Margie will back me up on this, that we're going for like eight or 10 feet maximum, um, sometimes even four feet, because they're a lot easier to handle than these 40 foots. So you hang them off the dock because it's easy to access, uh, easy to uh, go and inspect them, and also easier to clean them when you take them out. And one of the things is not to put them in too soon, or they can become fouled and not to leave them in too long after the eggs have hatched, because again, they can get fouled. Ideally, the curtains shouldn't touch the ocean floor at a low tide. Otherwise, you're going to get the starfish and the crabs will march on to the curtains and start eating all the row. And so once uh, the eggs have hatched, the curtains can be removed. But I'm sure Margie will tell us at the end, you can get a second round. And we did this year, there was a second round of um, herring that came in. So we've got uh, lots of groups, mostly Rotary Clubs, who are all volunteers, but we do rely on an extensive group of volunteer citizens who help us. Uh, we couldn't do this with just the Rotary Club, so we rely on a lot of volunteers to help us with this project. But here we've got the names of the uh, various Rotary Clubs. And I say we've got six Rotary Clubs. And we've got Leanne Ennis, who is a very keen environmentalist. And uh, she is always working with us, helping us, giving us advice, and even telling us what some of the uh, fascinating creatures are that you, you find on the curtain sometimes. And one of the things that I'm doing is there is a gentleman in Victoria Harbor by the name of Jim Shortreed. And he is also into uh, looking after the, the herring and all of the, uh, the spawn. And so he is a very reliable contact that we have over on uh, Vancouver Island. We do hope that we can spread this over to um, the island and especially through other Rotary Clubs as we move forward. Um, one of the things we've been doing is involving students and Rotary has clubs in uh, many of the high schools and the Rotary a group is called Interact. So we have an Interact club at Chadling High School. And here you see Margie is instructing a whole bunch of students from the high school uh, down at the government dock in uh, C Sharp beside the Lighthouse pub. And the students are really keen to learn what is going on and some of them get involved in the program. So what are the next steps that we're looking for in 22 and beyond? Um, we do send out a newsletter about what is happening, what's going on. And one of the things we want to do for 2023 is create an educational video. Uh, so we need to write a storybook on what this video is going to be. And using Eastlink Cable, the uh, videographer there, Brittany Broderson, has agreed to create video clips during 2022 showing the making and the dropping and uh, checking of the curtains. 
so that we can then use these video clips to create a educational video. Um, we have an information flyer that Leanne Ennis prepared, so we want to update that. And then if we can find someone uh, good to create and maintain a social media just for the Herring Enhancement Program. So we're looking for volunteers. And we're also trying to get more media exposure in both print and film. One of the reasons doing this presentation is to get the exposure out there because we want to draw attention to the plight of the herring and the fact that they're diminishing and we need to do something about it. And we'd like to promote this program beyond the Sunshine Coast. So we have a big vision uh, for 22 and beyond. Uh, we want to continue to support these activities and strengthen the conservation protection of our ocean and advance sustainability and also get harmony between the communities and the environment. So we are involved in other activities on the Sunshine Coast, connection with stream keepers. We're heavily involved with the salmon hatchery and we see everything is connected. So we're trying to ensure that we pull everything together. So we want to empower our community and get handle on grants and resources so that we can come up with local solutions. Uh, thinking globally, acting locally is kind of our motto. And we want to look at uh, what is the cause and effect of climate change and the environmental degradation, which has caused the problem for the herring. So we want to sort of make sure that we get together with other people in the community, like-minded environmental focus, and try and enhance our ocean waters. So that's one of the reasons we've been working on this herring enhancement program. So I would be happy to take any questions. And now I need to figure out, stop sharing. Wow, that was that was extremely informative, Mike. It's amazing the the program that you're working on and how multifaceted it is. It's just really really impressive. So thank you so much for that presentation. Um, with the Q and A, we had sort of thought that we would try to encourage folks to use your raise hand button through the through the reactions. But I feel like. It's a, it's a reasonably small enough group. Maybe if people want to just sort of raise your hand and let me know and I can, um, if you want to ask a question. Yep, go ahead, Billy. You're muted, Billy. Okay. Make sure you unmute yourselves first. Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that, I mean, just, it's so impressive the, the work that you're doing. It's just fantastic. I'm, and I'm so glad to see what you're doing with uh, getting the high school students involved. You know, that next generation who's uh, coming along and that's excellent. I'm, I'm just so thrilled to see what you're doing. But <laughs> my question was sort of about, um, I, I think, you know, I, I, I got the impression about the, uh, you know, environmental degradation and, um, and so on. But is there any way that the the kind of change in the climate and the ocean temperature is affecting the the eggs, or do you know that? Mm -hmm. We do. We we know that it's a, a soup of factors, and that's one of the largest as well. Mm -hmm. um, we see that in particular where um, areas are really quite the water is quite muddied up and dirty and contains a lot of fouling. Um, however. That being said, one of the biggest mysteries is we got the highest number of hairy, of uh, spawn hits in the dirtiest water. And that's right at the mm. Porpoise Bay near the, uh, just off from the Lighthouse Pub and up that foreshore. Ooh. Isn't that interesting? It is interesting. <clears throat> It just outlines the fact that we have not studied the herring. The herring is just a non-entity um, in the ocean a lot of attention has gone to the bigger animals. And we're just now really aware that we have to connect the dots between 
Um, if the herring aren't there, the salmon aren't being fed. If the salmon aren't there and they're not, the whales aren't being fed. It's all connected. The, the marine food chain is all connected. So we decided to get down to the bottom and work on both um, rehabilitation of natural habitat. But also I have to say, there is another factor that hasn't, uh, Mike's a Mr. Nice Guy, but I, I want to shine the light on the other factor and that's overfishing. Mm -hmm. Um, this year, the um, quotas were reduced slightly under pressure to have them reduced. It's a difficult call, really difficult. Lives or livelihoods are at stake here. So we understand that it's complex. However, <coughs> after the reduction of the quota this year of the herring fishery, the commercial fishers were only able to find 60% of their allowable quotas. Wow. The fish are not there. And when you just stop and think of the magnitude of the carryover effect in the ocean, if it's not there at the bottom level, that's all the way up. The animals, the other marine animals are stressed. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Can I, can I just throw one more question in here before yeah, I do? Yeah. Well, if that's if they're only finding sixty percent of their quota, that means the herring must be really, really diminished. So I'm Correct. wondering if that's because of uh, overfishing in the last few years. Yes, it's cumulative. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the the Halsiuk band uh, up the coast, the First Nations band put a moratorium a few years back on, on herring fishing. And within three years, the herring had responded and repopulated naturally back to uh, the same sustainable numbers. So it can be done. Yep, spot on, Billy. <coughs> and somebody else wanna ask a question? I have lots, but I, <laughs> uh <-huh>, good. <laughs> I, um, maybe I'll jump in just, um, one of the, one of the questions that I was curious about is I see that you're, uh, you know, working with Leanne Ennis and there's, you know, there's a science element to this. So looking yes. at DNA and this kind of thing, are you engaging with any of the, um, uh, like any of the universities or any of those programs? Uh, well, I'm a member of OceanWise, and they're an extremely great organization for education. And uh, the two Interact students, the high school students that were helping, um, both became members um, in order to write reports this year on what they were doing. And they use the modules through OceanWise. They're excellent. If you go on there and just press the link, learn, You'll see an amazing amount of information, folks, and I, I really encourage you also to, to um, consider signing up for the free new monthly newsletter by just simply uh, joining OceanWise. And le the, the learning modules are fabulous. It's true. Yeah, I also work with the Biosphere Initiative Society and we're yeah, good. Really linked in with that uh, group. And so, and that's sort of part of this conversation is that like the herring, you know, the spawn, you see all those amazing pictures of what goes on on Hornby Island and how yes, huge activity over there and then and, and not as much here. And that's one of the biggest questions for me is why in some places <coughs> are they thriving and in other places not? And is it really about like natural habitat that they um, dwell in eelgrass and kelp, but the curtains are to keep them going? But yeah, so what are the dynamics with that? Well, the herrings, yes, you, you have stated it really clearly. It's just a, a, a stopgap temporary measure. The whole point is to look at the larger picture and the herring balls move like this around the ocean. They're very difficult to, um, hmm, they program themselves. They go where they're going to go. And um, from California up to Alaska, this is a huge issue. 
everyone is experiencing, we're talking about the Sunshine Coast. What we have to remember is to put in the, um, the backdrop so we understand how the interconnectedness of things works. These, these mass um, movements of herring up and down the Pacific Coast uh, in all areas are going through the same pollution, um, ocean changing, temperatures and the works. So what we really want to work on is together with all the other rotary groups and other community organizations, um, ways to address the big questions. For example, um, reduce the noise, noise levels in the busiest areas. We haven't done that. Um, I've, I've written a bunch of specific um, quotes, but there, I think that we need to be uh, working with DFO who are under pressure because of course, um, the whole industry of the um, herring fisheries is a very important part of the commercial fishery industry and we have to support. So if we, um, uh, I'll not call for a moratorium, and though I'd love to, um, re reducing quotas means some fishermen are going to have to look at retraining, regrouping, making big changes. And there has to be an overall government plan to support these fishermen through the changes that have to be made. I know this and feel passionate about it because I'm from the East Coast and we're going down the same road that the cod industry got lost. Same thing, we have things were overfished and after, after the fact, um, people were uh, marine biologists and fishermen were left to put together the pieces in saying what happened. Well, we know now to take action now, take drastic action now and work in an integrated collective uh, marine resource management plan, supporting DFO who are trying to make changes uh, but their hands are, you know, they're under pressure to maintain, you know, there's always a status quo factor in every industry. And uh, we fully appreciate the difficulty they're under. But that in itself would be a, how, how, how we can help is ask people to become personally involved, learn more so that we can write um, educated letters to write the Honorable um, uh, Murray, who is um, Minister of, Force, of, of Fishers, and I think she now has uh, the Coast Guard in her title too, and, and ask, uh, make the statements that come from informed opinions and ask for changes. Show them that people care enough to ask for changes. Yeah, thank you so much, Margie, for that. That's You're like the, the, the point of these talks and this conversation is to connect with you and to connect with each other and to really start to, you know, um, inform community members about what the issues are and what's happening to, you know, help with restoration and also then to like, you know, raise our voices collectively together because that's, yes. you get more easily like there was yes. a, a letter that just went around from the the glass sponge reef gang in house sound to the minister about you know the, the illegal prawn fishing that's affecting the, the reefs mm -hmm. and through our conversation with dfo they said okay you know like they sent the letter to uh, minister murray and she's on it and there's you know they're starting to track what's going on there and so it's a mm -hmm. different issue because that's you know that the illegal fishing um, but it's still that same sort of, you know, making sure that the elected people and government understands this is a big issue for us for all of the reasons that you've already. <clears throat> Conservation funding at the federal level has been reducing um, greatly over the years. I, I uh, used to be involved in um, land management um, and and migratory herds in the in the interior and the same issues were at play there fewer and fewer uh, conservation officers were actually um, budgeted to actually to maintain the management so it's not 
any good whatsoever to have legislation regulations in place if there aren't the people to uphold and enforce the rules that exist. So we need to support for change there too. I saw that Mike had put his hand up. I'm not sure if you meant to do that. Mike Coles, did you, Michael Coles, did you want to ask a question? Yes, thank you very much. Um, given that the plant world is being affected, causing our swimming ones to be in distress, on the biological side, is uh, is there something that we can do or get the university involved in order to help the plant world adapt to the change of the warm mm. weather, i.e. helping them um, uh, by studying the genetic side of that to be able to find out if, uh, because the water's not going to get any cooler. It's going to get warmer and warmer and warmer. So mm -hmm. it's not mm -hmm. a problem. It's going to be leaving anytime soon. So mm -hmm. starting at that basis, same like we need to deal with forest industry, and our trees that are not adaptable to this will be changed. What structurally can we do in the plant world to help them adapt? You see where I'm coming from that. And that might be just a different perspective angle. It and, is. You know, so um, that key aspect of, and then given that aspect to help the plant world adapt, then when fishermen are being restricted in those ways of catching, uh, they could be subsidized and become mm -hmm. planters mm -hmm. so that they can then go and help to plant instead of using artificial curtains as such a beautiful uh, uh, stop uh, measure um, that uh, Mike was mm -hmm. speaking about earlier. So that mm -hmm. was... Uh, my, my perspective on that. And, um, Michael, that's very interesting. We, we, um, we began to explore that this year only. There's a development in, and a learning curve that we're going through as we um, see the results as, as, as we're further involved. Um, Leanne, I, I worked with Leanne Ennis in her lab one day where she's growing kelp and she was having trouble um, tying them to ropes underwater. Um, her babies were about this long. And we both said, I wonder if we could adapt, we could help the kelp adapt more quickly using what the eelgrass people are doing, which is wrapping them around little rocks. Because when you look in the foreshore yourself, Along the beaches, you'll, you can pick up pieces of a frond and at the bottom will be three or four little pebbles wrapped tightly around um, the bottom. So we're proposing that um, we, we figure out really exciting ways to promote that as a field trip for school kids, because really we're going, we'd like a whole bunch of these to be done and then planted in different areas because we're also noticing that <clears throat> some of the transplants that she put in Porpoise Bay took in better areas than others. And we're trying to work through what those factors are. In fact, that, that whole notion led us to want to participate in the, with DFO um, doing lab work this year. So I'm hoping that along your line of thought, <coughs> how can we assist in plant adaptation to um, restoration of habitat? that we'll uncover a lot more information yet, but we're just, just beginning. You wanna come and play, Michael? <laughs> sure. Well, if you wanted a, a little clue, Michael, as to what Leanne's doing, um, 
I did suggest to Coast Reporter and Kylie uh, followed up and there's an article in Friday's Coast Reporter about Leanne and what she's doing. Yeah, it's a, it's a really good intro. Mm -hmm. So it's the eelgrass and the uh, kelp, in other words, as the major areas of natural habitation for spawning herring. Those are the two plant species that we can assist if we can figure it out. So that is the question, and, and you put the nail on the head right there. And that's what we're trying to do in the field, but we haven't, we're not there yet. This um, this totally is a segue to um, to the fact that you know we so the SECA is partnering with the Friends of Forage Fish on some forage fish sampling project and then some eelgrass study in Seashelt Inlet. So there, you know, uh, Diane Sanford is part of our World Oceans Day yes. team, and she's just you know she's been at this for so long. There's a the eelgrass they're doing eelgrass washering on yes. Tuesday down at Armour's. Yeah. Beach. And then we're yes. doing forage fish sampling demonstration, citizen mm -hmm. science on the on the seventh as well. So this all ties in. I mean, all it of does. The, yeah, it's really so. I had a question about what you know if if I wanted to um, you know help uh, find a new location or in Gibson's, for example, a lot it okay. seems like lots going on in the inlet and up in Pender as well. And um, doesn't sound like there's anything happening down on our end as far as curtains uh, and history. How, how would we make that happen? Well, it's a, it's a really important location because that Hopkins area is one of the healthiest eelgrass remaining healthy areas on the whole entire coast. So we have to be very careful. And there are other factors to be mitigated too, like keep, the anchors and and uh, and motorboat engines out of that area, please, and educate people on that matter, and not take the kelp that's lying on the shore for gardens first thing in the spring when people begin to think of their gardening, because that may be the herring row habitat. They may have they may have lay, laid their their uh, row along the the foreshore. Um, keep the dogs off off that too and there's a lot of education going on and we're working on signage in conjunction with the uh, SCRD um, on uh, government docks to to educate the population about how to help the herring row itself if anyone would like uh, to help there are a number of things that you can do we are looking for more um, dock locations because we've got to get out to about a, a minimum 15 foot depth and we don't want to be jumping in boats and going all around and gobbling up gas so we're, we're basically um, limited to docks that have relatively fast moving but clean-ish water that <clears throat> doesn't have swells so high that they'll flip the curtains on themselves. Therefore, they're null and void and they won't be good for anything. So um, if people have any uh, knowledge of docks in what they think might possibly be a, a, a good location, they could contact Mike Price. Mike, do you want to give out your information or do you have something visual? Um, we can just do the Seashell Rotary Club at gmail.com. Sure. That's the simplest email straight through to me. Could you repeat it again for people? The yeah. masses of people that are listening to you now? <laughs> yeah. Seashell Rotary Club at gmail.com. Thank you. Or lowercase or one word. Yeah. Um, and then uh, we'll go out and determine whether those locations might work and people could um, help make curtains. Um, they, could, um, um, they could write letters. They could basically number one is to learn. And I encourage people to go to sources such as David Suzuki. There are three month youth programs there that are fabulous. Um, covering all of the ground that uh, you, you've mentioned, Suzanne, and, and more. Um, but uh, just reading the modules and learning from the OceanWise 
would be a really good beginning point for people. Then I think that um, um, whether it's a, a joining one of our groups and just seeing if they'd like to uh, turn out and, and uh, get involved at whatever level in whichever. That's awesome. It, 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 I sort of feel like maybe we could work together to just to compile some resources in a way that the SCCA could then promote the your work as well as mm. some resources that you're you're talking about right now so that you know we could we have a pretty good you know communication <coughs> outreach um, uh, program with the SCCA we have e-newsletters and you know great website and and this project as well but we sh we should uh, join up and share you know, share some of those resources in a sort of like in a package, maybe. That's a great idea. Um, visualize with me uh, for a moment. If you can imagine on both sides of the Salish Sea, community groups um, such as, as uh, Rotary dropping curtains on either side of the Salish Sea up and down. That, that would make a difference. And that's the, that's the vision we have in the most immediate term. Then we'll, through Rotary, because Rotary is well-established all over the world, using the clubs through Rotary up in, further up the coast and further down our coast into the US, ask those communities, once we've established a prototype here, spread it on and, and uh, spread it out loud so that hopefully we can make a difference very quickly in the hearing. And if it is possible to assist DFO and other governing bodies that manage the species, that community involvement and community educated opinion really matters. I think this is one of the best ways we can do it because we already have the infrastructure in place and the people who really want to help, so. We're headed in the right direction. We just can't get our feet going fast enough. Yeah, no, it's very inspiring. All that you're, all that you're up to, it's really amazing. Just want to check in with um, maybe Lori, Lori, or Sheila, or Michael. Whether I think Billy and Mary Lou, you would have jumped in if you had questions. Anybody else? Um, I, I just wanted to expand on that. Um, Margie was speaking about uh, getting the word out mm -hmm. um, from the different places where uh, the spawning and, and things are happening, you know. Um, and I'm not sure if there are things that are worked out, but I might suggest the uh, collective uh, which is the Firelight Group, the Indigenous Mapping Collective. And there's a lot of youth um, in there programming things that are based on the cultural aspects to identify things that are of the land. Even the city of Coquitlam had picked up uh, an aspect so that um, the app can be uh, utilized so Yes. When somebody is um, in a space and they see a plant or they see something that the community needs to know about, uh, it can mm. be a, a picture of and everything that can be added into the database mm -hmm. instantaneously and then also be accessed across the board. So if there's, if there's a movement of, of the herring that is in a certain places and one time and then maybe the other year spawning they've moved around so that that data could also be collected but also so that it's at the point of you know getting that information out as quickly as possible as you're saying you yes. know there's kind of yes. spawning time so there's uh, certain areas that need to be taken care of um and then that uh, information can be uploaded so uh voters could access it and say okay yes. we've got happening here this happening here and that mm -hmm. would be a fantastic resource that is being pioneered uh, right now to be able to adapt to this kind of uh, uh, information um, yep. resource to get I, that I didn't 
I didn't know that, Michael, and I'm so grateful to know about this, and I'm going to look into it right away, because gonna, that's exactly. I will put the, the uh, uh, it's the Firelight Group on the, the North Shore. Yes, yeah, so uh, Indigenous. It's a, uh, it's a part of initiative to decolonize. Yes. Map, um, collective. Uh, yes. And so, but this is uh, the mapping technology uh, utilization is being used uh, in different ways um, along the coast than where. Okay. As it is, so and it's all based on the Google mapping. And the whole so these are these are resources that um, um, that already are solid. Mm. It's just a matter of coding. Yes. And and we, we, do you so have cool. anybody? Do you have any suggestion of where I would go to find someone who could do that sort of thing? Yes, I'm gonna actually put in the the uh, the link for. I think this Suzanne put it up on the chat. Yeah, I just Googled it while you were talking, Michael, and I put the uh, the link to the Firelight Group, the mapping and GIS page in the chat. Yeah, the Indigenous and, mapping workshops we have as well. Um, yeah. yeah. Awesome. So it's, it's firelight.ca. Okay. Then, yeah, that's the main group uh, for, for, for uh, okay. which the other programs for the youth are being access so that is fabulous fabulous you just paid the price of admission for me right there michael yes. thank you so <laughs> very much this is exactly what uh, happens when you get people who come in different doors to the same body of of uh, information that we all need to work on together thank you michael i'm really excited it's wonderful yeah, you're very welcome. Okay, Michael um, just posted another link in the chat that is in it's www.indigenousmaps.com. The other one was firelight.ca and this one is indigenousmaps.com. Yeah, firelight okay. is the is the main uh group. Um of that, so yes, um, like I said, I do know uh, Coquitlam, the city of Coquitlam uh, is utilizing the same technology because I have another project where I'm trying to bring people back to the river and creating mm. a, a, a annual uh, old school walkathon that people can raise money using this app. People come to learn the, of the space um, where where the where the, the walkathons are, and uh, that information, that, and then all that information can then be studied by university. And so it's about it's about healing the land, healing the water that mm -hmm. heals the people. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's a full circle economics, and that and that money that's raised in a walkathon, just like your people support cancer and everything, is to be used. Um, to support the um, guardian network. Awesome. Which are the people who take care of the land out there um, in, in, in that way. Um, it's ongoing. Um, that need to be supported. Uh, most of them are all volunteers. Yes. Uh, but given the changes uh, of the land and everything else, he, uh, uh, in our weather systems, um, those aspects uh, giving people that place to to come and support their local communities. Uh, each area can have their own little walk, 10 kilometer walk, uh, walkathon type thing. Mm. And then the money, uh, money comes into the community. Mm -hmm. you know, traditionally, a lot of uh, charitable works uh, are all taking money out of the community. Uh, but, you know, I support cancer and other things like this, but the money comes out from the community, goes into the corporations, and it doesn't come back to that community mm -hmm. unless people are involved in it. So this is the basic of a reverse of that. And I would suggest okay. that maybe uh, even on the thought of that expanding on, on my idea is that you could also adapt that kind of uh, aspect with, that, um, with the 
the data and everything else to do a boating thing, you know, like, a, hey, you know, make a, 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 a you know, where, where you get people to go and find places mm. where people have boats who are on the water yeah. so that you could make it a fun game for them so that they can go out spot and people and then that you know make it in the way and if you know um people find places that would be suitable for for planting and so so yes. there's a whole expansion like a treasure be. hunt yeah, yeah like geocaching on this on the water yeah. particularly yes. if we if we could I'm use off the water. I'm big on the water so thank you pardon me i didn't catch that last bit michael i'm sorry i just said i'm very involved in when it comes to water, that's my, that's, I came from water mm. uh, nine months. My mom threw me uh, <laughs> out of the water nine months and threw, threw me back in the water. So yeah. <laughs> I've been on, with the water ever since. And I do a lot of work with the water and consciousness of that way. So, and that's one of the things why I wanted to join this because it is about what is in the water mm -hmm. and how we, uh, the water is, uh, as healthy nutrients that are being uh, in there with the plants I mean, it also helps filter the water to keep the water so and so forth in that whole cycle process thank you yes kelp actually um uh, helps uh, with carbon um seven times uh, more than trees do and we know how important trees on, on the land cl clean our air that's a perfect segue, you guys, because this, you know, we're coming near to the end of the talk and, you know, the whole, like, the context of all of the conversations that we're going to be having this week is the interconnectivity of all of these things, you know, that, and you started your presentation with that, I think, Mike, and you really built on that, Margie, through, all, you know, all of your words, and Michael, too, about how, you know, without... Mm -hmm. The habitat for the eggs the fish don't grow without the herring the salmon are starving without the chinook the killer whales are dying mm -hmm. and 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 we're all connected to that and our spirits are affected by this mm -hmm. and so from from you know this is one of the things that we're really working hard to do with with the festival is link people and i love it that we've got like michael's here it sounds like from coquitlam which makes me think I really hope you're hooked up with the Rivershed Society of British Columbia because this is a really great group that's, you know, working on the Fraser and the tributaries. Um, and then I just want to you know, sort of pull us back to um, the, you know, the beginning of, of this conversation was that the First Nations have been stewarding these lands from time immemorial and the traditional Indigenous knowledge is something that we're, you know, we're, we're trying really hard to um, access and build into these conversations, um, but it takes patience and a lot of work. And so I'm, I'm, I'm really appreciating that the Rotary Club is really in this place that you're, you're getting that. And this is all very much a learning experience for me as a conservationist for so many years with the SCCA, connecting up with the Rotary Clubs who are totally working on this amazing uh, stuff and now linking in with other groups. It's, it's really impressive. Um, so I just feel very grateful and super happy to, to know about your project and what you're doing. And I'm, I hope we can, you know, promote what, you know, your project and encourage all of our members to get involved and connect with you. And we'll put some information, more information, more links um, on the website. And also hopefully um, folks will, and you guys too, will chime in to some of the next NEMO talks. Tomorrow mm -hmm. we've got the District of Seashell presenting on development permit areas and how waterfront development affects the marine foreshore and how that links in with mm -hmm. all of these things. Mm -hmm. We've got the whale sighting folks from Saturna Island coming. And I really think, you know, check into that meeting. You're gonna be really excited about some of the work that they're doing that's that's parallel with what you're doing. So uh, yeah, everything's connected and I'm, I'm really hoping everyone's gonna come and, and make those connections together to support all the work that, that we're doing. Um, as a wind up, I really just wanna, um, again, I, I, I need to say a huge thanks to, to, to our presenters, 
the Rotary Club for all your great work, um, the District of Seashelt and the Credit Union for helping fund this. Um, and also to the SCCA, we have this really amazing uh, World Oceans Day working group, Diane Sanford, Angela Kronig. They're both you know, on the ground citizen scientists who've been working on these issues for decades. And we really couldn't do the good work without them. And of course, Billy, <laughs> Billy Carroll and Rhizome Up Media and the Green Film Series who are um, you know, bringing these issues to light and, and presenting them in a way that more people can access them. So we've got mm -hmm. brilliant, beautiful, heartbreaking and inspiring feature films and short films on projects all throughout the region um, on the website and of course, more talks. So um, <laughs> these are all gonna be available until the 10th, till the end of the day and then beyond as well. Some of the films won't be accessible um, year round, but a lot of the material that we're putting onto this World Oceans Day Festival website is meant as a resource and a place for people to connect. So I really- well, Including this webinar. Exactly. So <laughs> we, will, we will post it on our YouTube channel and then link it back onto that website so that people can, can revisit this and, and hear your story and connect. So thank you everybody. Thank you so much for yep. this evening. We really appreciate it. And uh, we'll see you, we'll see you at the next one.